Hi, I'm Chris Cooper. Welcome to The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Thanks for joining us. Today, Rita Jackson is here to show us how to make fresh basil pesto. And Walter Battle is here to show us how to make a couple of handmade gardening gadgets. All of that and more is coming up next on The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. So stay with us. This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid South is provided by Goodwinds Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Rita Jackson. Rita is a UT Extension Specialist right here in Shelby County, and Walter Battle is here. Walter is the UT County Director in Haywood County. Thanks for joining me. No problem. Happy Glad to, to be, be here. here. Good. Walter, did you bring your appetite? Yes. Oh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Well, this is going to be real good. Uh, Miss Rita, what are you making for us today? Today we're making a fresh basil pesto. All right. Mm -hmm. And so we'll talk about what, we, what goes in okay. it. Okay. First, we have uh, two cups of fresh basil. Okay. You're going to need one third cup of walnuts or pine nuts, um, three cloves of garlic, a half cup of extra virgin olive oil, okay. um, half cup of shredded of Parmesan or Romano cheese, and then salt and pepper to taste. So, um, I like all those. Yeah, and that's what <laughs> makes it smell right. so good. Yeah. <laughs> First thing uh, in your food processor, you just add your basil. Okay. And um, you don't have to chop it or anything, you just pour it in. And it's about two cups. And um, you can smell it really, mm -hmm. fresh, fresh Ooh, herbs just good. really, really have a, a awesome aroma. And then you're going to add your nuts. And what we recommend is if you have walnuts that aren't chopped, go ahead and chop those before you put it into okay. the basil. Um, and that way it's going to be really, really good and fine. Okay. And then you're just going to blend that up. Just a couple of pulses. Okay. Just a couple of times. Mm -hmm. okay. Doesn't take much. Okay. Because we're going to blend the rest of it, too. Okay. Now, Rita, so while you're doing that, what's the difference between spices and herbs? Herbs and spices? Um, with herbs, they, are, they usually are leaves that grow on um, low shrubs. Okay. And those are like rosemary, basil, oregano. Um, whereas spices usually come from other parts of the plant. Okay. Like um, cinnamon is from the bark. Mm -hmm. um, we have ginger, which is a root. And then, like mustard seed, yeah. uh, comes from the seed. So, uh, and what we did was just basically add our nuts. So we're gonna add our garlic. Pulse that. All right, chop some up pretty good. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna add our olive oil. And what we also recommend is if you have a food processor that has a little spout okay. where you don't have to take the top off, um, it blends a lot better. Uh, if you can. Um, Add it in as the food processor is going. Oh, okay. So we're also going to add our Parmesan. It's looking good so far, huh, Walt? <laughs> <laughs> now, herbs are nutritious, right? Well, yes. Okay. Uh, what we usually, most people use herbs because they add so much flavor to your foods, and they usually substitute for a substitute for salt. Okay. So if you want more flavor um, in your foods, we do recommend trying different herbs and spices in substitution of salt because that's going to help reduce your sodium intake as well. Okay, so, good deal. Okay. So we're going to blend that. And then... Now, what's the general rule for the amount of herbs or spices you're going to use when cooking? Well, usually it depends on the recipe. We, re we usually recommend following a tested recipe. Okay. Um, if it's your own recipe, we usually recommend that you just try a couple of different things according to your flavors or what it is that you like. But if you just really don't know and you need to follow <laughs> something, yeah. uh, then we uh, recommend going to spiceadvice.com. 
It's a website that's a good resource for you to determine exactly what flavors you need, how much you need, according to what it is okay. that you're preparing. Spiceadvice. Spiceadvice.com. Spice yeah. <laughs> it's right. awesome. Okay. So then we just added our salt and pepper to taste. So you're going to blend that really well. And basically, you have your finished product. Now, one thing we also recommend to keep on hand is a spatula mm -hmm. because your basil is going to go on the sides. And so you want to make sure that you get all of it into the blender okay. to blend really well. Now, when you're cooking, when do you add your herbs? Beginning, middle, end? Yeah, when you're cooking fresh herbs, you want to add those towards the end of cooking okay. or right before you serve okay. because the prolonged heat is going to... Um, deteriorate the taste, the aroma, the flavor. Okay. So just right before, right before serving or towards the end of your cooking. Okay. okay. You got this down, Walter? You can make <laughs> it up here. Yes, okay. Yes. So we've just spat, put some more down in there and we're just gonna blend that. And basically, that's it. Huh. So it comes like this and this is your finished product. Right. And um, pesto is really, really good on pasta. Okay. Um, other people put it on baked potatoes or um, some baguette, uh, toasted baguette like we have here today. So it's a really good um, mm -hmm. flavor to use when you're just trying to do something different. Um, a lot of people are not um, familiar with different ways to use pesto, so this is just some ideas. Wow, that looks pretty good. And let me ask you this, so mm -hmm. can you substitute dried for fresh? Yes, okay. you can use substitute dry for fresh. What we usually recommend is, um, it depends on the flavor or okay. the type of herb that you're using. Okay. Um, usually it's recommended one tablespoon of fresh okay. to one teaspoon of uh, crumbled or ground uh, herbs. Okay. So about a half teaspoon to a fourth teaspoon of a ground herb. So. Okay. So you can do that. You can. Right. Now, a do, lot of people do. Do you grow herbs at home? By do I? Place? I had a couple of little pots in my window okay. seal. <laughs> my right. mom is more of the one who's, okay. who has the full garden. So, But I had some a little bit of basil here and some oregano. So it, it worked out well. Okay. I'm well, usually not a green thumb, so, <laughs> but it works. All right. Well, look, let's go ahead and taste. All right. All right. So what, like, this is one sample where we have where you just shows just a little bit of pesto is okay. all you need uh, if you're doing your pasta, and you're just going to mix that up really well until it's good and covered. Um, not a whole lot to it, but you don't need a whole lot, especially if you're new to pesto, because um, it, it can be very strong. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're not very familiar with pesto, uh, just try a little bit and then add it um, accordingly. So, okay. And Walter? Have you had it before, Walt? Oh. Uh. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, at a restaurant. Okay, <laughs> and what we're serving it with today, this is linguine. Okay, that linguine. Um, you just cook for about 10 minutes, um, al dente, and then... This is restaurant Rita. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Uh, no faces. <laughs> good face for me. <laughs> very good. Well, good. And you can also just put some different types of cheeses on top. Um, a lot of people combine them with um, cherry tomatoes, things mm -hmm. like that, just to do a little toss. So, so what do you think? Hey, like this, it? This, this is real good, and, and it's healthy, right? Yes. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> Especially if you use a whole grain pasta, it's okay. going to be even better for you. So. Let me try one of those. Sure. Let's try it all. <laughs> huh? Okay. Good. <laughs> yeah. Mm hmm Good. Awesome. Okay. Now, we're going to have this recipe up there so people can see it. Okay. Um, awesome. So is this something that's it's pretty easy to make? It's very up. easy to make. Um, it only took, you know, just a few minutes. And basically, you can keep it in your refrigerator, um, uh, again, using it for about a week. Okay. You don't want to let it sit too long okay. in your refrigerator sure. like with anything. So. Um, but once you prepare it, we really go ahead, advise going ahead and using it for whatever it is because the longer it sits, the less flavor you, that your flavor is going to deteriorate. So All right. If you make it, go ahead and use it. So. All right. All right. All right. We appreciate that, Rita. No yes. problem. Yeah, well, thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot for doing okay. it. Good. All right. I, hey, I, Kitchen Diva. How about that? <laughs> there you Here go. we go. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you.
All right. Thanks again, Rita. We definitely uh, no appreciate you doing that. Enjoyed it. You, you enjoyed that walk? Yes. <laughs> yes, it was very delicious. All right. Watch out, Mother Stewart. All right. Here we go. Homemade gardening gadgets. So what do you have for us today, Walter? Well, uh, uh, these are some things that I use uh, in teaching sometimes when I do school demonstrations okay. or teach a young gardener, um, you know, how to garden. Uh, one thing I like to show is what I call my gardening stick. <laughs> and, um, you know, a lot of times when you read the book and it may say, you know, plant beans four inches apart. Right. Well, what I did, I just simply marked beans here and I just lay that down on the row and then I just have the kids, you know, right. drop a plant That's there. Smart. and. You know, then go up another four inches, drop another one. So it's, it's just real simple and easy to use, and I don't know. Uh, and they used to give these things away at the field days. Mm -hmm, they do. So, you know, so you can always get you a good fresh supply of them when you need them. Uh, another thing that I also use, uh, sometimes we have uh, problems <laughs> in the garden with the row middles. And for those of us who really do not like to chop, mm. Um, well, what I kind of did, I kind of created a homemade hooded sprayer. Okay. <laughs> and what I do, I just take the nozzle off of my, of my sprayer here, and, uh, and I just stick that into a <laughs> pot and wow. put this little washer I got from my mechanic <laughs> on there. All right. <laughs> and you just slide that up and then uh, screw that back on, <laughs> like so. That. And then... Uh, Instead of getting out the old hoe, I just have myself a hooded sprayer to, there it is. You know, to, <laughs> to take care of the middle rows. Right. Now, like I said, this stuff is not patented, so right. uh, if you can take care of that for me. Um, and, uh, <laughs> uh, it gets the job done. It gets the job done. So that was just a couple of tricks that I use you okay. know, in teaching garden and kind of make life a little easier, so to speak. <laughs> okay. Now, what about your watering equipment? Oh, well, uh, first, as far as the rows are concerned, I am a big fan of soaker hoses. Okay. Because you can just lay them aside, the, uh, the plants, you know, such as a long row of beans or corn mm -hmm. or whatever, and then the water's just right there at the plant. Sure. You know, you're not getting water on the foliage. Right, right at the root and, zone. That's right. right, right there at the root zone, because when you get water at the foliage, uh, you, know, you get diseases sure. and, on the fruit and stuff. So that's why I'm a big fan of soaker hoses. And also, as far as watering the uh, <laughs> container plants, um, I kind of just took the <laughs> little sprinkler part off this. Okay. And, and this enables me to just stand over that plant and just really pour water right there by the root zone. <laughs> so, you know, it's just a real nice little easy way to do that. <laughs> See if you can set that one down. Okay. So that kind of makes life just a little easy for, you know, for the gardener, so to speak. So it makes life easy for you too, right? Yes, yeah, make life easy for you. Okay, now what are some uh, cultural practices that both organic and conventional gardeners should practice? And, and, that, and that's a good question because Great you, question. you know these days you have people who are gardening organically. That's right. Okay, and they want to be safe, so what are something they can both do? Uh, big thing, rotation. Rotation, okay. Rotate your crops. Uh, it's going to keep you from building up disease pressures. Uh, it's also going to help you maximize the nitrogen uh, so like in a spot where you had your peas or your beans, uh, you would put <laughs> that, uh, you would plant corn or tomatoes in that spot the next year okay. because those are nitrogen lovers. Sure. And see the beans and peas with a fixed nitrogen in the soil. It also helps you to combat uh, nematode issues uh, and also disease issues because you won't get those buildups, you know, in one particular area. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very important. Okay. Crop rotation. Crop rotation. Okay. Um, now, tell us about the kudzu bug that was discovered, and I, I did see the information mm -hmm. out in southwest Tennessee. That's right, in southwest Tennessee. Uh, yes, the kudzu bug is here. It is here. Um, the kudzu bug is a native of Asia. Wow. Um, it is a little small, it's, it's, it's slightly smaller than your ladybug. Okay. Uh, it is a bug that is very, very, can do a lot of damage on uh, legume crops such as soybean mm -hmm. and, of course, snap beans, mm -hmm. or bush beans, as people call them. Another thing about this particular bug, it's like ladybugs, it will get in the home in the wintertime. Uh -oh. And uh, it can overwinter on uh, kudzu, 
hence it's nine. Yes. And we have plenty of kudzu. Yeah, why don't you just South. eat that? Yeah. Just eat <laughs> the kudzu so and You would think we'll just be happy right. just yeah. eating just, it's the kudzu. There's plenty of that right? to go around. Uh, but evidently, it's like everybody else, it yeah. gets greedy, so <laughs> yeah. they won't see yeah. other stuff. <laughs> but, uh, but they will come into the home, and, 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 and they're kind of an uh, uh, kind of olive, brownish color. Cu- color. Okay. And they, they do have a stain, a brown stain that when you crush them, oh. and it has been known to be uh, a skin irritant to some people. Okay. Okay, so just kind of remember that. But okay. it's, it's here. It's here to stay. Okay. Any control that we know of? Um, Are they still working on they're, that? They're still kind of working on that. The, the Bioprinthrin product okay. uh, is what's currently being used. But since it hadn't been in this country long, we really just don't have a lot of things labeled for it. All right. There's your cut zoo bug. Okay. Um, what is a good way to keep our agriculture chemicals? Oh, Let's talk well, about that. Yes. Uh, well, as, as Chris has said a lot of times on this show, first <laughs> of all, Follow the label. Yes. The label is the law in regards to agricultural chemicals. Uh, now, another thing you do want to keep, obviously, keep it up away from children. Mm-hmm. You know, you do want to keep them, you know, where people just can't just go get it and, and play with it because it's not a toy or anything okay. like that. Also, I label all my different containers. Here's one I have Good labeled diazonon, and I have one named, uh, uh, labeled neem here. Okay. Uh, and, and the reason being, that way I know to spray this for my fungicides and things like that. Okay. I will, and I only put neem oil in, in this. That. It's okay. a great product for organic growth. And then um, here I only put diazonon. I, I also have them labeled for my weed control. Mm-hmm. I have one labeled for non-selective herbicides. And I also have one labeled for the grass herbicides. Never, I never ever use them to cross them up. Okay. Because, I, you know, th- those uh, chemicals can, you know, lodge into those... Mm-hmm. You know, places, sure. and then you'll spray some weed kill on your plant. Sure. So you don't want to do that. Yeah, and some of that residue would be left in that that's bottle, right. too. That's so exactly yeah. right. Yeah, I've made that mistake before. Mm. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have, too. Yeah. So that's why that I got me a good Sharpie and started uh, <laughs> labeling this stuff. But the main thing is do not let them freeze. Uh, okay. You know, try to keep them in a place where they can't freeze. And, they, and, and they'll hold their potency quite a long time. Quite a long time. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right, well, quickly, we have uh, one more thing I wanted to ask you about. How would a person practice no-till farming? Okay. Uh, well, um, let me say this as, as far as gardening is concerned. Right now, there are no vegetable crops available on small scale for okay. homeowners that are approved for, you know, no, you know herbicide resistant. Okay. So th- there is some, uh, you know, Roundup resistant sweet corn and I believe potatoes, but they're not labeled for the home oh, okay. owner right now. But, you know, it's just a matter of time before that comes. Yes. So uh, what you really want to do is start with a very clean, um, uh, you know, weed seed bed. So you want to go out that spring, burn the crop down with a non-selective herbicide. And then, of course, uh, you want to come and also apply uh, some type of pre-emergent herbicide. And then you would just plant in a little slit uh, your corn or your beans or whatever. And uh, and then just kind of farm what we call farm ugly, and you'll get you one of those good old homemade uh, hooded sprayers that I just showed right. you how to make, and just kind of keep your road minerals clean, and you'll be fine. Okay, mm-hmm. and, and that should do the trick. Should do the trick. Okay, the homemade <laughs> sprayer. Yeah, homemade. All right, hooded sprayer by Walter. All right, <laughs> this is our Q and A session. And Rita, if you have something to say, jump in there with us, okay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's our first viewer email, Walter. Okay. It's from Charles, uh, from over in Murfreesboro. So thank you, Charles. He writes, is there an easy way to get rid of horseradishes that are spread into the pepper and tomatilla area of my garden? I'm thinking there's nothing to do other than dig up all the shoots and the connecting roots, but I thought I would ask anyway. What do you think? Well, I can tell you, he's on the right track. He's answered the question. <laughs> yes, you, you basically have to dig it up. Yeah. Um, you, there's nothing out there that really would just take it out. Uh, there is some work with uh, 2,4-D, yeah. but it's so volatile. Yes. You know, it's kind of, yes. ah, you know, you just kind of don't want to fool with that. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you just have to just dig it up. And it's going to take several attempts. You got to kind of keep it chopped out, and, but you'll get it over time. Yeah, that horse radish it spreads. Yes. You know. Like yes, nobody's business. And the thing about it is, yeah, you got to dig it up. You got to dig it up. Yeah. And then when it tries to re sprout, mm-hmm. you got to make sure you get that out of there, too. That's right. I have known some people that actually uh, will spray those sprouts with a glyphosate 
product. Mm -hmm. I know everybody doesn't want to do that, but that's just one way to do it. But mm -hmm. just dig it up. Yeah, just have to dig it up. Yeah, and I think you'd be fine. All right, thanks, Mr. Charles. Here's our next question. I am seeing these tiny white specks flying out of my shrubs like a white cloud. What is it? And I can tell you what that is. We've had several people come into the extension office, uh, and one in particular is in her azaleas. She went out to, uh, to water her azaleas, and all of a sudden, all these white flies. Oh, yes. That's what they yes. are. So they're white flies, and hey, here's the thing you need to do. Insecticidal soap will take mm -hmm. care of that for you, or just a heavy stream of water on the underside of the leaf. Right, it's the underside deal. of the leaf. Okay, not on top, underneath. Got to get good coverage because know this, bugs are smart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can spray over the top and they're going to the bottom. That's right. Sometimes you just wait until <laughs> you right. finish. That's, That's right. Just, you know. That's right. So underneath the leaf, and, and you'll be fine. Anything else? That you might know about that? Well, no, that's that's pretty much uh, it. Uh, okay. Now, if you have uh, white flying bugs and you have hackberries or sugarberries, then that's going to be something totally different. It's going to be the Asian woolly hackberry aphids, mm -hmm. and it's going to be the winged form. So again, if you just use some insecticide soap, or in the winter time use a dormant oil, mm -hmm. then you'll be fine. Okay? Yes. And I wonder if you could use something like a neem oil. For that, I, I don't know for I, sure. I don't know but, okay. for sure. Yeah. Now I do know that orthing will also okay. uh, uh, take out the white fly as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. But yeah, if you want something safe, insecticidal soaps, a heavy stream of water, just to dislodge them and knock them off, would be just fine. Okay. But it's always good to investigate. That's right. Always good to do that. Okay. Here's our next question. I have these brown cocoon-like things hanging from my evergreen, <laughs> and no, they're not ornaments. Okay. <laughs> so what is it, and what should I do, Walter? Well, it's basically bagworms. It's bagworms. And I would say now it's too late to really mm -hmm. take them out. But you would want to pick them off and just destroy those bags yeah. because that's the next year's uh, crop, so to speak. It is. And, and here's the thing about it. It's too late at this point. Mm -hmm. yeah, they overwinter, and then they're going to hatch out what, in the spring and in that's the summer. Right. The female is going to lay about 1,000 eggs. Mm -hmm. wow. 500 to 1,000 eggs. Think about that for wow. a second. Wow. So if you don't go ahead and pick those off, yeah. then you're going to have yeah. a problem because, yeah. uh, you know. <laughs> she's pretty efficient, isn't she? Yeah, that's pretty efficient. Yes. Yeah, and she actually lays her eggs and then she dies and falls mm -hmm. out of the cocoon. Mm -hmm. um, so, but she leaves behind enough. That's right. But yeah, at this point, just pick them off if you can, if you can reach them. I have seen trees, evergreens, I provide a full mm -hmm. of bad words. So yes. they will defoliate some of your smaller shrubs right. and, and stress them out. Yes. You know, especially those shrub, you know, shrubs have not been watered or have That's not right. been taken care of. That's right. Then they're going to go out. Mm -hmm. All right. So those are your bagworms. And, yeah, come back in the spring, control them with a BT orthine. product. Orthine mm -hmm. is something that uh, UT does recommend for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'll be just fine. Okay. Here's our next question. Is it best to use household bleach or alcohol to clean your tools? And we're, we're looking at Rita. <laughs> <laughs> I assume it's both. I mean, I, I've, I've, I believe it's both. Is that true? Yes, yes, you, you're correct. Yeah. Uh, okay. Actually, you know, both is, is fine. Uh, I, I would say this, uh, probably to clean my equipment, you know, finishing up for the year, I might would use the uh, bleach solution. Okay. But as far as my pruners, uh, I would hit those with alcohol. Okay. Because, you know, there is a little bit, if, 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 if bleach is kind of misused a little bit, it can cause a little problem. Okay. With some, with, with some what kind of alcohol would you use? Uh, I just use regular just regular alcohol. It was at seventy percent isopropyl. Uh, yeah. Alcohol. And what then with the bleach, you have to dilute it as well. Right. That's right. right. Yeah. That's right. It's two cups to the gallon. Yeah. Two cups of water. To the gallon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dilute it, and, and every time that you would cut, I would mm -hmm. spread, you know, the equipment yeah. down, clean it off, and then yes. uh, cut again. Because uh, you definitely have to do that. Go ahead. Yes, and you also be careful when you prune in somebody else's yard. <laughs> because you might bring, you know, you might be bringing their disease to your plant. Sure. Wow. So yeah. always disinfect that equipment, mm -hmm. you sure. know, when you move. Like sure. That. And, you know, something else, too, with bleach that I just thought about, uh, if you waste it, it gets on your clothes. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. So. Yeah, so that might not be such a good thing. Right. Yes. Yeah. Right. But, yeah, go ahead and, uh, yeah, clean that equipment off with the bleach, or you can use the alcohol, and I think you'll be... You'll be fine, fine. especially mm -hmm. when you're out there pruning. I know what fruit trees right. and some other things like that. And this is not the time to prune your fruit trees. That's right. You do not want to prune right now. You Really, the best time is early spring. Right, is early spring. We, is when we recommend pruning. Okay, late winter, early spring. Mm -hmm. 
okay, and, and you'll be fine with that. Uh, I have some tools at home. This is the time of the year where I actually go and, you know, clean those tools off because I'm not using them mm -hmm. now. That's right. Yeah, at this That's point. Right. Neither yeah. do I want to use them now. I, I want to rest. So I want to get my yard to rest. <laughs> yes. Uh, for sure. You feel the same way? I, I feel the same way. And also spray a little WD-40 oh, okay. on your on your tines and things because that kind of keep it from rusting. Oh, yeah. Okay. You know what I'm saying? About just, that. just little things like that. Okay. Thanks for that information. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. Be sure to connect with us. Receive weekly email updates about Family Plot by visiting WKNO.org and signing up under Get Local Show Updates. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org and be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Chris Cooper. And be sure to join us next time for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe. Production funding for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwinds Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation The WKNO Production Fund The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you.